Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Just to let you know that this presentation is being recorded and will run approximately 60 minutes, including question and answer time at the end, and will also be available in the Events Industry Council's Knowledge Hub. All attendees today will receive their CEs approximately one week after the webinar. Before I turn things over to our CEO, Amy Calvert, I would like to address a few logistical items. Attendees can listen to the webinar through their computers or by dialing in using the number and passcode provided by the Zoom software. If you have questions, you do not need to wait until the end of the presentation to submit them. We encourage you to submit your questions using the question box seen on your screen. We will address as many questions as we can at the end of our presentation. And now I'll hand things over to our CEO of Events Industry Council, Amy Calvert. Amy? Thank you, Derek. So good afternoon, everyone. I want to first of all thank you for joining us and thank our esteemed panelists for being part of this conversation today. Before I get to the introductions, I did just want to say a few words and um, you know talk a little bit about where we are as an industry right now. You know, our message, and many of you I'm sure saw um, the statement that was released yesterday in concert with some of the other, other industry organizations has been simple. We're really wanting to encourage everybody during this time to, um, you know, really show up in a way that offers empathy and, and um, information to folks in a real-time fashion. I think that um, we know the situation is very fluid and it's evolving as we speak and as we um, spend time together today. I think we're... Um, most um, efficient when we are coming together to share peer-to-peer -peer information, insights, and um, to allow us to be able to make decisions from an informed place, really focusing on facts. I know this is a very difficult time, and fear is a very powerful emotion, but I think it, it really makes a difference when we spend intentional time like this together learning and sharing. So really value this time together with everybody. I think we know, and the other important thing to point out as an industry, you know, we are very unique in that we are very collaborative and we are very supportive of one another. And part of the reason that we know this is so important is because we understand the value of events, um, global events, that we support over 26 billion people across the globe. And many of those people on the front line are really those that are going to be the most impacted right now um, due to COVID-19. So it's really important that we come together and find ways to support those people through this time. You know, we know there'll be postponements and cancellations, but we need to be thinking about in the interim, what can we do to ensure those folks are in a good place? So on behalf of all of our member organizations, EIC has done a, a nice job at um, compiling tons of resources on our website. Derek referred to the Knowledge Hub, but also on the Insight Hub. We have a tremendous amount of information available to you, including some real-time updates from WHO and the CDC. And again, I kind of point back to using resources like that to allow us to make informed fact-based decisions. Um, PCMA, MPI, IAEE, and SISO all have tremendous resources. Um, SISO actually just released um, a statement yesterday in partnership with UFI about um, the show continuing. I think that's really a powerful tool to utilize. We also have a survey live in the field that I would encourage you to um, take part in. You know, part of the reason why we wanted to deploy this survey is to really get a better sense of how we can offer additional solutions to all of you, resources, um, as we learn more about the situation as it continues to unfold. So again, um, you know, thank, thank you for all of your support and um, thank you for your time today. I think this is going to be a great discussion. Um, we have some tremendous panelists um, who have lots of experience and I, and I know this is going to be very interactive. So allow me to first introduce our moderator, Elisa Peters, CMP CMM. We're fortunate enough to have Elisa as our chair-elect for the EIC CMP Governance Commission, and she's just been a staunch supporter of the CMP community for years, so thank you, Elisa. Um, Elisa is a world traveler, a global advocate. She's also a senior global account manager for Experian Merits, a global events company, and her specialties include international and domestic meetings, contract analysis, negotiations, and meeting marketing. And she's consistently been recognized by Experian for her um, 
expertise and her spirit of collaboration and partnership as their trusted advisor of the year. And she's also served on the IBAD uh, Board of Directors for MPI International. And then we have Barbara Dunn. I know many of you have um, had the pleasure of listening to Barbara speak on a variety of topics. Barbara um, is a partner at Barnes and Thornburg. Barbara is also um, a very active meetings industry advocate, has focused her practice on representing organizations in travel, hospitality, exhibitions, meetings, um, looking as well at supporting nonprofits and related organizations on a variety of legal issues and nationally recognized by our industry as a sought after speaker and author on these issues. She's also a member of the Academy of Hospitality Industry Attorneys and serves on the board um, as an immediate past chair of that organization. And then we also have Tyra Warner, PhD, Esquire CMP, attorney and professor. Tyra has been a, also a staunch supporter of the CMP community for years, has expertise in legal and crisis preparedness for meetings, events, and hospitality related industries. She teaches hospitality and business courses at the College of Coastal Georgia. She's also published and widely quoted on legal and crisis management issues in the academic and trade publications. Her 25 year meetings industry career has included management roles in hotels, travel, destination marketing, associations, catering, law, and academia. Tyra is only one of two people in the world who is a licensed attorney, has a PhD in hospitality, and has a CMP. Um, so we are lucky to have um, these three really dynamic and um, powerful leaders in our industry to be with us today. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elisa and um, get this program started. Thank you, Amy, and thank you to all of our, we have over 2,200 event professionals that have joined us today. So I just want to thank each and every one of you for your strong commitment to our industry, because I think it, it says a lot that in less than 24 hours, you kind of dropped everything to hopefully spend your lunch hour with us. So um, our panelists today are going to be sharing their thoughts and experiences. I'm sure most of you that have been are on this this webinar have had a chance and had the privilege of sitting in a session with either Barb or Tyra. I feel blessed to have them both on this call or on this webinar and to call them both friends. And um, they are both the people that I would turn to first uh, for counsel. So I will say with that said, um, obviously the the critical disclaimer here is that none of this information provided should be considered legal advice for your organization. You should go out and consult your own attorney, um, but this will at least give you a start as to the conversations that you may want to have. Um, so I am going to kick it off by um, asking Tyra first. Um, one of the things I did, um, I'm going to tell the audience right now that we actually have something in the chat box. So if you don't have the chat box selected, make sure and go to the chat box. You actually are going to have the ability to upvote questions. So if you see a great question that you want to make sure um, we address at the end of this session, please make sure and upvote so that we can be sure to address those questions if we don't hit them during this session. So Tyra, we've had several questions from our audience. We ask questions um, during the registration process and on various social media platforms. And a lot of people want to understand force majeure, what it means, when it applies, do local or federal states of emergency automatically constitute grounds for force majeure being called? Um, can you explain a little bit more to us about force majeure and when it applies? Sure, Lisa. I think this is a great place to start um, because this is, you know, at its heart, I guess, our, our big issue with coronavirus um, uh, and contracts and our meetings right now. Um, force majeure, you know, what, what we're looking at mostly right now is, is the um, it is will you know when we're looking at coronavirus? If we decide to not hold our meetings, are we looking at a cancellation? Or are we looking at force majeure? When we're looking at force majeure, you know what we're asking really is: if I don't hold my meeting, can you know do I have to pay cancellation damages or not? So force majeure is the contract clause that you have that says 
we can terminate the contract without liability, without paying damages. The key to the force majeure clause, though, um, is that um, it has to be illegal, impossible, or depending on how the clause is written, um, impracticable or commercially impracticable to hold the meeting or for the facility to host the meeting. Um, and that's really the key here. So when we're looking at it, it truly has to be impossible, illegal, or commercially impracticable to hold or host the meeting. So when, um, when cities or if states are declaring states of emergencies, generally what those are, are, are done for is to free up funding or to get federal funding in the event uh, that coronavirus it does create issues so that we can get the federal funding that we need to uh, to combat that. Um, that is not, the states of emergency are not there to say we can't hold meetings. Uh, they're not there to say hotels, you're not allowed to allow public assemblies or to uh, to do those sorts of things. So in short, a state of emergency is generally not a reason uh, to declare a force majeure. Um, now, there are some exceptions. So, for example, um, the state of uh, Switzerland um, actually passed a law that said uh, that it banned any public assemblies of more than 1,000 people. So that was the country's law that said we ban for a certain period of time, or for the time being anyway, any public assemblies greater than 1,000 people. So if you're going to have a convention for more than 1,000 people, well, now it truly is illegal in the, in the country of Switzerland to do that. So yes, then it is a force majeure. But on a general state of emergency without a law like that in place, I'm afraid it's not. It doesn't fall under force majeure. Mostly what we're looking at right now is people's fear of coronavirus, making them not want to attend meetings. And fear, by and large, is not a force majeure. Excellent. Um, Barb, kind of uh, playing off of that or expanding on that, we know how many event professionals are wondering if they should or shouldn't proceed with events. We hear about cancellations because they're making the headlines, but what's not being talked about necessarily are the nine, over 19,000 uh, conventions that are happening over the next three months that have decided that they're going to move ahead with their meetings. Can you help us understand better contractual requirements or thoughts around um, when to cancel and when not to cancel? Sure. Thanks, Elisa and Tyra, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much to the Events Industry Council for putting on a webinar today. The decision to as to whether to cancel uh, or whether to proceed with reduced attendance, uh, at the end of the day, what I have told my clients is that's a business decision. And I've asked my clients in large respect to put blinders on as to the contract or as to the insurance. Now, that's not to say that those items are not important. They are very important, and certainly we'll be speaking to those today, but it's a business decision. Uh, what is the purpose of your meeting or event? Can you still fulfill that purpose of your event? In other words, accomplish the goals of that event with reduced attendance? You know, those are the big questions. And so I, I encourage uh, my clients to think about that first to put blinders on and really focus on that as the question. Now, having said that, there really are those two paths. Now, there may be other variations of those paths, but what we're seeing are either meetings cancel or meetings going forward, but with reduced attendance. So I encourage my clients, if you're sitting, if you're on the call today and your meeting is say 30 days out or 60 days out, what I've encouraged my clients to do is to chart both paths that is the path of cancellation and the path of reduced attendance. And chart those paths and see what they look like. Among the key things to consider would be what is your organization's critical mass of individuals who would attend this meeting in order for it to be the, the purpose of the meeting to be accomplished. So for example, if 10% of your people can't come, 
is that going to upset the delivery of the, what you're doing, your educational content or your research delivery at your meeting? Maybe not, probably not. But then what about 20% or 30% or greater? So it's going to vary with every conference and every event, but I do encourage my clients to, to talk about that internally and determine what your critical mass is. So that's very important because as you're plotting these paths, that number will be important. It will also be important from a contract perspective and from an insurance perspective, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a, just a little bit. The other thing I've asked my clients to do in charting that path is to have a go or no go date. So what is your organization's go or no go date? Meaning which, when are you going to decide, to decide which path you're going to go down? Because that's important. Um, if you have a large trade show and you're, it's in 30 days or more and your exhibitors are gonna start shipping uh, booth material, then that might be the date, or maybe we try to push that date forward a little bit. Uh, if you're talking about what we've seen in the last couple of days of folks even getting on the planes or setting up booths and then a cancellation, not ideal, but it can happen. So ideally, as an organization, your team should come together to decide on a go, no go date on any given meeting and map that date and map what that path looks like. And the path is gonna have a number of components to it uh, communication and otherwise, and again, we'll talk about those. So stepping back from those two key questions uh, would be the contracts that make up your meeting. So facility contracts, convention centers, hotels, and then your large vendors, decorators, AV companies, uh, destination management companies, or DMCs. We want to look at all of those contracts. Um, Tyra, as Tyra described so well, the concept of force majeure and why we, why we preach the importance of including a clause in every contract. Because this, is, this example, among many uh, others that we've all seen over the years, demonstrates that you know, our, our meetings are a, a set of dominoes stacked uh, on, in, a, in a really cool design. But once one, the first one goes down, everything happens. And so the, all the different contracts that make up your meeting are all going to be important. So getting your hands around those contracts, looking at whether the force majeure provision would apply is important, and then making some determinations. But again, I, I step back, Elisa, and really say to, to my clients is, can you accomplish that business purpose? Because we can all, we lawyers, we can always play cleanup, so to speak, on, on cancellation fees or attrition fees, or we can argue about force majeure. But, but that's separate and apart from the business decision that your organizations have to make. Elisa? So expanding on that a little bit, would your exhibitors or attendees own individual business transient travel policies qualify as transportation curtailment if those employees and or exhibitors who would be your attendees at a conference could not attend the conference? So my two word answer, Lisa, you know, you've heard me say this before. <laughs> it depends. Every, a lot of folks on the call have heard me say this before. <laughs> T-shirt that says that. Uh, I, I try not to wear it around town too much. <laughs> Outside of our industry, folks may not uh, appreciate what that means. I say that obviously in joking, but what I really mean by that is that very argument about the critical mass, if your force majeure provision speaks to, as Tyra indicated, commercially impracticable, then if you can show a critical mass of your attendees can't travel to the meeting because of their company imposed travel restrictions, then that may rise of the level or rise to the level of rendering performance of the contract by the group commercially impracticable. It, it, it frustrates the purpose of the meeting. That's essentially what that means. And, you know, I'll, I'll be clear on this point. I've looked at lots of contracts, obviously for 28 years, but also, in, you know, in the last two, three weeks on this issue. We're not going to have a problem establishing coronavirus as a force majeure event. That's just the first part of the clause, as Tyra mentioned, where it really, it really makes a difference, as Tyra mentioned, is that 
Once the force majeure event happens, what does that have to do to performance? So Elisa, going back to travel restrictions, whether they're on the list, whether disease is on the list, at the end of the day, there's typically a catch-all statement, such as including but not limited to, or, um, or any other cause beyond the party's control. We're going to always be able to check that box. It's the second box, the second requirement that's going to be important. So if your clause speaks to commercially impracticable, or if your clause speaks to 30% or more of the people can't travel, then this is the type of information that you'll want to keep and you'll want to collect. Excellent. All right. Well, Tyra, um, what are the potential obligations or liabilities that event professionals and organizations should be taking into consideration when they're making a decision regarding their own refund policies, meaning when they're receiving cancellations from participants or exhibitors? Um, well, I'm going to kind of go back to what Barb said um, about business decisions. Um, you know, there's there's not there's not so much a uh, a legal must do on this. Um, hopefully, these are decisions as far as uh, refunds to attendees or refunds to exhibitors. Um, if there's um, and of course we're looking at cancellations in two scenarios, right? We're looking at um, if the group decides not to hold the meeting versus if the group decides to go ahead and hold the meeting, but participants decide not to attend or exhibitors pull out. Um, do you know? So you've got the diminished attendance, um, and hopefully the group has ha has a solid. Um, refund policy in place before COVID-19 was ever even conceived of. Um, you know, and this is why we need to have these good plans in place all along um, so that we're not reacting, so that we are, we're proactive and we can just implement plans we already had um, into place. But I think, you know, it really is a, a business decision um, so that, um, you know, of course, if the, if the group cancels the meeting, I would think there would be an effective refund policy that they would have in place, um, you know, and I would assume that if the group is canceling the meeting, they, they would have, they would refund um, everything um, and that they would have, have the funds to do so. Um, if the group is not canceling the meeting, um, that's where they, you know, that's where I think you end up in a little bit of a different situation potentially. Um, and most organizations hopefully have a policy written up front when an exhibitor sends in their um, sends in their exhibitor application or when an attendee signs up for registration um, that says, you know, in the event of cancellation um, other than due to an emergency, um, this is our cancellation policy where, uh, you know, and whether that, you know, we'll, can we'll refund you all but a certain percentage um, or, you know, we'll apply your exhibitor uh, fee to next year's event or whatever that is. As long as they've done that up front, I think that's pretty, pretty easy. And that's what most organizations will do so that they're not in uh, financial straits um, for, for the current year's event if people do start pulling out in just this kind of a situation um, where the expenses are still there, but the revenue suddenly takes a dip because of, of this kind of fear. Um, I think the problem comes where there are planners who, who did not have that forethought to put those kinds of cancellation policies in place, um, and then the obligation does become a little bit gray. Um, and I, you know, I think if there's not a cancellation policy in place, I think um, an, or, an organization, to me, it's a little bit of a gray area um, as far as what, what they must do and what they can do. Um, I still think they need to have a discussion, decide on their policy, implement it across the board, but it's certainly harder to do after the fact than it is um, prior to. So if organizations are operating without solid cancellation policies that are put in place at the time uh, of registration or at the time of accepting exhibitor applications, take this as a lesson and point and do that from this point forward. Um, and if Barb, if you have any other uh, comments on that particular point, I welcome your input. 
Yeah, Tyra, I, I can't agree with you enough. And in particular, I want to highlight one thing you said, and obviously I know you have a particular expertise and passion in this area, and that is crisis management and planning. This is like any other a crisis. So those, those of you who have already developed the crisis management plan for a different scenarios, look at that plan again, because that you may be able to use some of those elements with regard to this particular crisis. I think that's important. The other uh, point you make, Tyro, is with regard to all the other contracts that make up meetings and trade shows, including contracts with sponsors, contracts with exhibitors. Um, the, to Tyra's point about the policies, refunds, cancellation, et cetera, agree you know, wholeheartedly that um, those agreements should speak to that as an issue. And if they don't now, they should going forward. Uh, I know we're going to be talking about um, communications, Elisa. So um, that, that probably dovetails into uh, that, the next question. Um, so I'll, I'll throw it back to you, Elisa. Yeah, I, you know, I think that right now, um, many people are worried and, and wondering, can they get health, can they get insurance at this point? Um, can they get insurance for existing events at this point that would cover them for this? And then there are some people that are looking for information about what should they be searching through their policies looking for as it pertains to COVID-19. Um, on the event side, do any venue insurance policies offer any kind of support? And I think this goes and, and speaks to concerns from planners that if they go ahead with their event, invite all these people in, and somebody gets sick at the conference and spreads the virus, um, is, is, does their insurance cover them as far as that's concerned? Yeah. So uh, let me take that last question first, Elisa, because it is a question on everyone's mind. The potential that an organization who hold, which holds its meeting, someone later becomes, uh, comes down with the virus uh, and uh, makes a claim against the group. So general liability insurance typically covers personal injury or death um, at meetings and events. So that being said, likely that insurance would uh, kick in and defend that claim. Now, I say likely because, of course, every insurance policy, like every contract, is going to differ. The other thing I will tell you, many of you ask yourselves this or you get asked this by your leadership, uh, can we be sued? The answer is always yes. Uh, the courthouse is open 24-7 online. And I say that jokingly, but with sincerity. And, and my, my latest add-on is to say that plaintiffs' lawyers uh, need to send their kids to college, too. <laughs> you know, there's an industry of, of folks, yes, that could say that. Is it likely that they could establish causation, that, it, that someone got that at your particular event as opposed to during transit or at home, et cetera? That part's going to be very difficult to prove. So, you know, yes, I would look at your general liability policies, make sure you have coverage for it. Um, but, you know, even if you were to get sued again, um, I likely think that insurance would kick in to cover that. Now, let's step back and look at event cancellation insurance, because that is a different type of insurance. So liability insurance is a backbone of all types of insurance that the organization should have, again, covering all sorts of mishaps that, which could happen at your meeting and event. Event cancellation insurance is really business interruption insurance. So think about it this way. Your meeting or event or trade show is an asset to your organization. It, it makes money. And because it's an asset and because it makes money, we want to insure it so that if something happens and we can't have that meeting and earn the money that comes from that asset, that we are protected by way of insurance coverage. And, and Tyra and I, we've known each other for a long time. We talk about this a lot, how important event cancellation insurance is because it's another way to manage your risk. So in the concept now with regard to uh, COVID-19, organizations which had policies that were written probably up to say sometime in December or early January. If infectious or communicable diseases was covered under that policy, it will be covered as it relates to COVID-19. 
And again, you know, obviously you'll want to look at your individual policy. So the most important page in an insurance policy, whether it's your car insurance or your liability insurance or your cancellation insurance, are the exclusions. So when you look at a policy, flip to the exclusions page and see what is not covered. And if anything on that list is something that you want to get coverage for, that's when you have to dig into your pocket and pay money in order to get what folks commonly know as an endorsement or a rider so that you can get that coverage. Now, the two policies that I see in the US that are relating to event cancellation insurance, uh, one policy does not have infectious diseases on the exclusion, meaning that it's covered. Another policy has it on the exclusions list but some of you might have purchased an endorsement or a rider to get infectious disease coverage. Couple things to know. Um, number one, the insurance covers not only cancellation, but it also covers reduced attendance. Now, having said that, the endorsements might limit that. So for example, I've seen endorsements for infectious disease coverage, but it only, talks, it only covers you if you cancel your meeting or you reschedule your meeting. It doesn't cover for reduced attendance. So again, every policy is going to differ in that regard. Most, most important, if you have a policy, even if you think it doesn't apply, take a look at it, share it with your legal eagle, talk to your broker about it, and make sure that it, we determine whether there's coverage. I, ideally, you know, I prefer a legal eagle to review it first, because, you know, uh, although brokers are, are very good and smart folks, I, I would rather have you really kind of understand what your rights are under that policy. But with any insurance policy, the most important thing you can do is to give them written notice of a possible claim. Even if you think you're not going to cancel your meeting, I would still recommend giving written notice. And each policy is going to speak to how that happens because the, one of the main ways insurance carriers try to get out of covering groups is if they fail to give timely notice. So that becomes a very important element. Now moving forward, um, are these policies going to change? Yes, they already have changed. Yes, you could still get the infectious disease coverage, but it's likely not going to cover COVID-19. Um, yes, you're gonna pay more for that. But you know, I wanna, I wanna step back and, and emphasize again that this insurance is, is really good insurance. I mean, it covers things that are more likely to happen. For example, hurricane season, snowstorm season, um, weather is always an issue um, and, and the insurance covers that. Uh, covers the damage to your principal facility. If something were to happen at the convention center where you're having your meeting, even cancellation of a principal speaker at your event is often covered. So um, this, event among many others in our industry has highlighted the importance of it and you know we have we're fortunate to have lots of insurance folks who understand our industry so resources like events industry council and our other industry organizations will have um, good referrals for those of you who don't have that coverage but still want to get that coverage and elisa just picking up on that last question about facilities and their insurance um, certainly, again, they have liability insurance just as the group should have. And so um, I don't know necessarily that that insurance would cover their additional costs to, um, to increase their, their hygiene or sanitation practices. Um, but that's a reasonable ask, of course, um, to make sure that we understand. Uh, hotels have been incredibly helpful, as they always are. But I've had, in the last several days, I've had a lot of our uh, clients, hotel partners, help them craft a statement. I know we'll talk about communications in a few moments, but help them craft a statement as to what the property is doing relative to hygiene or a convention center. So if you're, on, if you're not sure what's being done, ask the question and ask them for help. Ask for statements. We are all in this together. And, and with that said, Elise, I'll turn it back over to you. I can't agree more with that. Uh, the rallying that I have seen from our community um, has just absolutely been incredible thus far. Um, this is kind of 
a very uh, similar situation from a hospitality and tourism standpoint as it was right during and after immediately following 9-11. I've heard that reference a bunch of times the last couple of days. And I think working together is, is really going to be critical. So on that note, um, we wanted to do a quick survey to make sure you're all still alive. Um, we want to see how you are planning to approach COVID-19 and the outbreak for your events. Um, we're going to be putting a survey up asking you to vote if you are proceeding as planned, if you're increasing hygiene and communication with attendees and other stakeholders, adding a hybrid or a virtual option, postponing your event, or canceling your event. And I'll give everybody about 30 seconds to submit their vote. Do, 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 do. All right, Derek, let us know when you're ready to put that, the responses up. So it looks like 28% of you are proceeding as planned. 40% uh, uh, on that note are increasing hygiene and communication with attendees and other stakeholders. 8% of you are looking at virtual components. Only 14% of you are postponing and only 10% of you are canceling. So I think that's pretty awesome. I love, uh, love seeing that for sure. So I'm going to actually kick the next question back to Tyra. As the lead author for the EIC manual, that lovely light bit of reading on risk management, can you start by giving us an overview of the process for event professionals? As we see that only 10% of the people that are in this webinar right now are planning on canceling, um, what do they need to be thinking of in terms of risk and COVID-19? Sure. Um, well, and I noticed from the from the comments that a lot of people said they were doing multiple uh, of those poll options. Um, I guess because everybody's doing multi, you know planning multiple meetings, so um, it's they're they're employing different strategies for different meetings. Um, but you know, I think in terms of of risk management, because I I am hearing a lot about the the polar things, you know, that, that people are either just sort of shrugging and going forward or they're uh, avoiding and, and worrying about trying not to, to hold meetings, um, where, you know, whereas it seems like for most of, of risk management, we should be working on our managing and mitigating the risk. But, you know, I think the important thing is, in, is that um, every meeting is different, and that, you know, that's one of the main things that makes risk management for meetings so different than risk management in other industries. Um, and I often say this, that, you know, if you, if you look at, at risk management, risk analysis in other, meeting, in other industries, um, it's a lot easier because you're usually talking about um, a business that operates out of the same physical plant on the same street in the same city in the same place with the same people coming in and out every day. So it's pretty easy to tell what your risks are. Well, meetings are just the opposite of that, right? We're we're in uh, you know we're in Dallas one day and Chicago another day. We're in a different facility that's a public building where we have people coming in and out. We don't know who's meeting next to us. Our meetings are all different. We have different speakers. We don't know what um, what the you know contentious issue du jour is. So you really have to part of a the big part of risk analysis here is looking at your specific meeting uh, to say what is, how is this, and for this particular risk, how is this risk truly impacting this meeting, my meeting on this particular date, in this particular city, state, country, um, you know, on these dates, um, and going from there. Because I think there's just been an awful lot of knee-jerk reaction um, and panic, frankly, around coronavirus. So I think part of it is pulling back and being very realistic to this risk and the particular meeting that people are planning at the particular time. Um, so for example, I was, I was talking to a friend and colleague recently who's planning a meeting in about a month. Uh, all local attendees in a major U.S. city uh, where no coronavirus uh, patients um, yet have been found um, and was just sort of wondering how to proceed, um, you know, and, and my my result, you know, my suggestion was, well, you can't really get out of the contract, so you, you probably might as well go ahead 
and proceed. Um, plus, there's there's very little risk really right now. Um, so you know, I think just being very realistic um, about the risk, and and then just sort of deciding, well, are we just going to accept it and move forward as as is, which some people are. Um, you know, are we going to manage or mitigate the risk? And remembering that mitigating the risk means either um, reducing the likelihood that something's going to occur. And frankly, we just don't have a lot of um, a lot of power over coronavirus itself. But we do have some power over um, reducing the risk of the transmission of it, right? Um, or reducing the consequences if it does occur. And that's really what we have more power over. And, um, and to that end, I would strongly recommend if planners and, and, and meeting professionals have not, that they go look at the CDC um, page. CDC.gov has a whole page on coronavirus. And they even have a subpage. If you click on the uh, businesses page under the coronavirus, they have a whole page specifically just for events. Now, it's meant for mass gatherings, um, but it has some great suggestions. It even has a specific page of just the cleaning products that actually kill coronavirus. Um, so there's a lot of great information there that gives us some good ideas of what we can do at our meetings um, and in our workplaces to help mitigate uh, the risk and the transmission of coronavirus. So, you know, I think there's a lot we can do um, in looking at this to sort of analyze realistically what's the risk for this particular meeting. Now, part of analysis is as situations change, we have to go back and look at it again. Well, when there are cases, when we do start testing more and more cases are apparent, when, um, you know, if, if the governments do start declaring uh, not just states of emergency, but if they start putting limits uh, in place on mass gatherings or that sort of thing, well, then you have to adjust. But I think it's really important, um, A, that we're realistic, and B, that we don't just jump to either a shrug and we accept it or a complete ban and we avoid it, but we look at the management and mitigation techniques that we have available to us. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the things I've been seeing on my client side is a, a real attempt at collaboration. We've really been trying to work with our hotel partners to make sure that as a team, we're making good decisions that protect everyone. So for example, maybe choosing menus if an event is a week or two away, choosing menus that could be scaled up or down very quickly based on if this fizzles out or if it accelerates in, um, in, in worry for our potential attendees. So I think the sure. giving yourself time and the ability to look at the situation, make good fact-based decisions is definitely critical. And then, you know, really taking more of a collaborative approach versus an adversarial approach. I think that's absolutely great advice. Um, Barb, are there any critical must includes on communication to attendees um, for those organizations that are, are moving forward to just legally protect those organizations from risk or from uh, potential lawsuits if something were to happen at a conference? Is there anything critical that an organization should consider including in any kind of public facing statement? Yeah, I think the importance here is to speak to the facts. And Tyra mentioned the CDC website and all the good resources there, which um, I would only echo that along with all of our industry uh, organization websites and the resources that they have there. Keep in mind with any statement with regard to your meeting, less is more. So as I mentioned at the outset, if we're charting two paths, one for cancellation, one for continuing with reduced attendance, you should work on holding statements, communication statements, um, as it relates to each of those paths and as it relates to each of your stakeholders, attendees, exhibitors, sponsors, et cetera, uh, because that does become important. So um, for folks right now, meeting 60 days, you're on, looks good, you know, probably having a very simple statement on, on your website about it. Uh, if you're going forward with your meeting, um, reminding folks um, uh, about the you know, hygiene practices or letting them know what will be available to them on site is a good idea. 
certainly we never want to say, you know, we, we, we guarantee your safety or we guarantee your health. Of course, we, we can't do that and we wouldn't say things like that. But, you know, less is more. And, and I think there are two things that, I, and my list will probably grow on this, but right now there are two things that I would recommend you do not put in your statements. One is anything about refunds until you as an organization have a chance to fully vet that internally and just see what that looks like. So having a response regarding refund requests that essentially is a non-response or we'll get back to you type response. So if you paint yourself in a corner with regard to yes, we're giving refunds, you've painted yourself into that corner. The other thing I, I, I don't like to see, and this has caused a lot of blow ups on social media in the last week or two, I've seen statements um, groups have made along the lines of, uh, well, there's no current state or federal travel restrictions, therefore our meeting will go on. And, and the reason I say it in that way is that it's, it, has, it, it leaves the impression to a lot of folks that we're insensitive about the issue. So optics matter. And if you don't have on your team a crisis communications person, uh, there are lots of good folks out there, and uh, meetingsmeansbusiness.com website has some fantastic um, sample statements, too. But that becomes very important. Make sure the optics of your statement are appropriate. It, they really do matter. And updating your statements as you go. But plan ahead. Think ahead. If your meeting is in 60, 90 days, this is exactly when you should be taking notes of what other groups are doing and, and beginning to map your holding statements on either path. That really does become important. Elisa? So this is a question actually to both of you. Um, it's come up a bunch of times in the, the Q&A and the chat box, but how do you recommend starting the conversation about partial performance? So that would be uh, trying to hold the event, but not having your feet held to the fire in terms of full performance as it relates and pertains to food and beverage minimums or uh, your room block uh, performance. And then what, what do you view as being um, the best approach to take with hotels? Uh, as far as this is concerned, and attrition, trying to avoid or mitigate the damages from attrition in food and beverage or rooms. Tyra, why don't I throw it oh. to you? Because Barb, I know you just had a mouthful. Sure. Well, um, well, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, I think a, a good force majeure clause does address um, you know, performance in whole or in part. So if, if you are in a force majeure uh, situation, then there is, there is an excuse of partial performance. But as we've said, um, in most cases right now, at least in the U.S., this is not rising to a force majeure situation. Um, so we end up having to either, um, you know, either look as um, you know, either look at, at other situations that might excuse performance, or we have to sort of turn to, um, to turn to our the relationship with the hotel, or we just have to look at our uh, attrition clauses, um, our food and beverage attrition clauses. But um, you know, I, I think there are situations, um, you know, where with numbers down, um, you know, our, our choices, most food and beverage um, clauses tend to be written in a revenue sense. Um, and, you know, with numbers down, with reduced attendance, um, you, they probably are going to end up in a, in a food and beverage uh, attrition situation. And I'm, and I'm not sure short of a negotiation, if you know far enough out, a negotiation with the hotel, um, you know, uh, as Barbara was saying, you know, if you can find out why, you know, people can't make it if it's due to, um, you know, travel bans from their, their companies or that sort of thing, um, if there's a, a good reason that they can't come, uh, they're just hard conversations that planners are going to have to have with hotels. It's, it's, it's you know, the hotels are being uh, hit revenue-wise left, right, and center, um, as are the, the planners. So it's... Um, 
sort of just a sharing of pain if it does rise to a situation that event cancellation insurance um, covers like a, a partial force majeure. These are, you know, business interruption. This is something that it business interruption insurance. Um, this is something event cancellation insurance can pay for as a, a downturn as well, um, not just a full cancellation. But it really just kind of depends on on the reasoning for why it happened. Excellent. Yeah, and Tyra, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And, and, you know, the way I like to broach the conversation with the hotel is a bit of a hat in hand. That is a bit of a humble conversation that we're both in this together. This is not the situation that we would want, but we're making the best that we can. And working with the hotel, say we really want to have this meeting, but we need some assistance because from a financial standpoint, if we perform, but perform at a significantly reduced level, we're going to have losses. And sometimes those losses are even greater than a cancellation fee if force majeure doesn't apply. And hotels have made it clear, and, and Elisa gave, you know, mentioned, and I've, I've said this myself in the last week, uh, that this situation is much more reminiscent of 9-11 than anything else I've seen. And one of the reasons I say that is because hotels and groups got together after 9-11 and, and agreed essentially, you know, some business was better than no business. And hotels were very flexible in working with the groups to get people on site. And that's exactly the situation we're in. But, you know, the, the approach to the hotels should be one of a partner, one of a, of a, a humility, if you will, hat in hand. Um, but the, you know, the, the folks that approach this as you, you have to do this, you have to reduce my block, et cetera, they don't have to. And again, I, I agree with Kyra, the best language in a force majeure should allow for partial performance without a fee. But from a business standpoint, even if your contract doesn't say that, that is absolutely a reasonable ask. And I suspect you will hear on the other side of email, phone call, et cetera, flexibility on the part of the hotels. So definitely ask, and if you agree to waive attrition fees or reduce your food and beverage minimum, please, please get it in writing. Remember, that's an amendment to the contract, uh, and you want to have both parties sign that amendment. So everybody's on the same page with what the new agreement is going to be. Elisa? So I think what we're going to do, because we only have five minutes left, is I'm going to uh, have you guys respond to the kind of six most upvoted questions, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, the first one is, if the CDC raises the level of alert to a higher level, meaning like a level three or a level four, which basically would discourage large groups gathering or a kind of domestic travel uh, restrictions, would that uh, constitute force majeure? Well, this is Barbara. At least I'll go back and, and give you my it depends answer. But likely the answer would be yes. But again, I think we're already probably at yes right now. Um, remember the first part of the force majeure, majeure clause is the list. And typically on that list, if your item isn't listed, but there's a catch-all statement, um, certainly increased travel advisories will qualify. Some lists actually speak to particular travel advisories, and that's certainly fine too. So yes, I think it will help. Um, I think from a business standpoint, as, as both Tyra and I have emphasized, the business decision organizations need to make about uh, go or no go, uh, I think to the business decision, that's going to have an impact. Because I think the business uh, folks might be saying, no, 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 we still want to have it. And then if an alert goes up to make it more risky, then I think all folks are concerned about everyone's safety and welfare. And that might change the business decision. But I don't necessarily see it change um, a contract position on force majeure. All right, that's great. And then I, I did have a, a question that was submitted um, with citywide business when it comes to transportation curtailment. So if uh, this particular planner had a 25% curtailment all, uh, allocation in their force majeure clause, but it was citywide business. So the food and beverage events had, let's say 1500 people 
uh, set to attend in the schedule of events, but the room block only had 500 people. In that situation, is it the food and beverage that the contract would go off of to dictate the 25% travel curtailment, or is it the room block itself? Um, well, that's obviously an ambiguity in the contract that should have probably have been written in such a way that it wasn't ambiguous. Um, you know, people think lawyers write contracts because we're paid by the word, but we write them the way we write them to get rid of as many ambiguities as possible. Um, you know, of, of course, lawyers represent whichever side they represent, but um, my my knee-jerk reaction to that would be the room block, not the food and beverage, but I think there's probably an argument to be said either way. Um, it'd be hard to say without actually seeing the verbiage in the contract and where that language appears exactly. Okay. What do you think, Barb? Absolutely, Tyra. I agree with you. And um, typically when we see these types of clauses where they speak to a percentage, Typically, it, it refers to 25% uh, of the attendees are prevented from coming or deterred from coming. Uh, that typically means attendees probably as to the larger number as to the conference as opposed to the room block. But I agree that we should, that should definitely be uh, clarified. And, you know, we've talked a lot about our partnership with the hotels and how the outreach is. Don't forget about the Convention and Visitors Bureaus, the destination marketing organizations. They've been tremendously helpful as well with regard to resources and citywide. So the citywide transportation issues, et cetera. Um, definitely our DMOs, the Convention Visitors Bureaus out there um, are, have been tremendously helpful. And I know continue to, will continue to be helpful, uh, again, as a resource for uh, meeting professionals as well. Lisa? All right, well, it looks like we have run out of time and we wanna be cognizant of everybody having a hard stop at 12.30. So I'm gonna kick this back to Amy to close it up. Yeah, so really well done to our panelists. Thank you so much and great questions from the participants today. Just a couple of key things really um, struck me that we need to keep top of mind as we go through this um, crisis with COVID-19 is that you know we really do need to um, think about in good times and in times of crisis our, our crisis planning and our resources and really have a good handle on the um, contracting and insurance mechanisms that we have in place in our organizations, really kind of taking a dive into those on an annual basis, making sure that we have great um, crisis communications plans, that we have appropriate team members in place who specialize in those things and that we understand the risk that's at hand for our individual events. I think for, you know, for all of us, we understand that this is an industry that has been built on partnerships and the importance of those partnerships, particularly now, to, you know, approach these conversations, um, as Barbara said, with humility and with empathy. I think we all know what's at risk. You know, this is an industry, like I said earlier, that um, supports over 26 um, million jobs and these are um, really great people on the front line that support our events day in and day out. And so we really want to make decisions that are grounded in facts and um, try to work to manage fear and emotions through this time and um, consider the impact. And then think about, you know, if we do have to postpone, what else can we do to help support these communities? But I think, again, it goes back to relying on some of these trusted resources and um, we have lots of those available at your disposal, but thank you again for making time today, and we look forward to future conversations. Turning it back to Derek for some housekeeping, correct? Yes, thank you, Amy. Um, and that concludes today's webinar. On behalf of Events Industry Council, I would like to thank our presenters, as Amy stated. Um, again, EIC will be sending you your CE one week after the conclusion of today's webinar. And as a reminder, this webinar will be available for playback. Um, this webinar will now end. Thank you, everyone.